Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Like the claustrophobic astronaut that just needed a little space, this is the Discriminating Gamer. Say, kids, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell from Osprey Games. Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell from Osprey Games is based upon the book and the BBC TV series, and it deals with uh, magicians and magic set uh, in England with the backdrop of the Napoleonic Wars. Let's take a look. The game board consists of a map of Europe and an enlarged map of London. Essentially, you can move from location to location around Europe, or you can move into London and through the various locations within London. Now, as you're doing this, you're going to be meeting some different people, working some different magic, and having all sorts of goofy adventures. Now, at the top of the game board, there is also the fairy track. This represents the man with the thistle-down hair, the evil fairy, and one of the major antagonists of the book. Essentially, you're going to be tracking his uh, power as it grows throughout the game, and at the bottom of the board, you have a prestige tracker, which tracks the prestige of the various players, the magicians. Players are going to have various different cards, but your basic cards you're going to have in your hand are your introduction and invitation cards. Essentially, you're going to get invitations to go meet people, you're going to get introductions that will get you prestige. Each player is going to have their own player board, which will have certain information on it. It will kind of have their, their magic uh, pool, I can't remember what it's called, but you'll have different spaces for different kinds of actions you can take on a specific turn. Like, you can use certain magical abilities that you wouldn't be able to normally use that turn, or you can move in certain places that turn, or you can take a book of magic that turn, but there's different things you can do on that uh, space, and you uh, in your pool, rather. And then below that, you also have your connection track, meaning you meet uh, powerful connections that give you special abilities as well. Now, the first thing you do during a game round is you move the uh, year tracker. The year tracker will advance, and then you place a Marseille card out. Now, the Marseille cards are like, you know, big tarot cards, and they give you specific information. They're going to tell you how many cards you're going to draw at the uh, end of the round, the uh, invitation cards you draw at the end of the round, but it also is going to say what specific types of magic you can use that round. And there's different kinds of magic in this game, you know, like like uh, different elements, you know, like, like I think fire and wind and earth, etc., etc., and it's going to say you can only use certain kinds of magic that game round. Now next you have certain books of magic that will be available. Like I say, you can go ahead and claim them for an action later, but uh, you're going to go ahead and kind of cycle through them. Put a new book of magic card out and remove an older one. Player's turn is determined by their space on the prestige track. And so the first player that goes first, the, he's going to decide, does he want to take an action? Uh, like I say, does he want to be able to use some magic that is not available during the current uh, year based on the Marseille cards? Uh, does he want to you know, take a special movement action? Does he want to draw a magic card, a uh, book of magic card? What does he want to do? Well, he can go ahead and make those uh, decisions there. But once you go ahead and you place a magic token, uh, or one of your magic tokens, action tokens, in one of those spaces, you cannot use that again until it is cleared, until you steal the waters. And that's something you can do. Instead of taking an action, you can steal the waters, essentially collect all of your discs off of those things, so now they're all open to you once again. Now, players can then move two spaces, and they can fulfill their introduction and invitation cards. Essentially, your invitation cards send you to different places in Europe or London where you can, once you get there, you can draw introduction cards, uh, or you can uh, draw feats of magic cards. Now, feats of magic cards, these are essentially how you gain points, so you're going to want to draw them. But you also want to increase your prestige. You want to be kind of first in player order if you can, and you have some other advantages, you get more connections, it makes you more powerful in other ways. So there's a tension there between gaining prestige and getting the magic cards you need in order to get the most points to win the game. But when you fulfill invitations, uh, you can go ahead and get introductions, and then when you get introductions, you can meet people like the Duke of Wellington. As I say, this enhances your prestige or reputation among the magicians of Europe. 
Now, those introduction cards also have the magic on them, so you play those cards for their magic. Again, do you want the prestige or do you want the magic? Next, you'll have the opportunity to do magic. Now, your feats of magic cards essentially have places for all those elements I discussed. Some, some feats of magic will require, you know, three or four different kinds, or some will just require maybe three of a kind. But you have to look and see what is available from the Mersai card, because those are the only kinds of magic that you can put on there that round. But, as I say, if you've taken the action to do different kinds of magic, then you can also use those kinds of magic. They're available to you that round as well. So you can go ahead and try to fulfill those feats of magic card. Once you do that, you place it face down, and it's got a point value on it, which you will reveal at the end of the game. Now, at the end of the round, you're going to draw a number of the invitation cards based on what the Marseille card tells you to. You're going to draw that many cards to bring your hand up. If you have more than, I think it's five cards, because you only have a total of five introduction and invitation cards at a time, if you have more than five, you have to discard down to five at that time. Then it goes, of course, to the next player. Now, on four game turns, 1811, 1813, 1815, and 1817, you're going to have kind of the fairy uh, phase of a turn. Essentially, what you're going to do is see if the magic that you have created, essentially your, the, the magic that you've been able to fulfill, if that is greater than what the uh, fairy's magic is. Now, the fairy's magic advances when the new Marseille card comes out. It's going to tell him how far he advances up there. But you are going to go ahead and you're going to see if you have... Uh, essentially met the um, conditions if, you've, if you have a greater amount of magic, if you're equal to or a greater amount of magic than the fairy. If that is the case, the game ends. Now, the person who defeated the fairy is not necessarily the winner, but that will trigger the end game. So players are going around and around the board in that prestige order. They're making connections with other, uh, with other characters that give them more abilities. They're meeting other famous characters, and they're also playing those magic cards, gaining invitation cards, and generally they're trying to build up an engine here that will give them as most points as possible, magic points as possible, during the game. Now, if the fairy is not defeated by the end of the game, by the end of 1817, I believe, then nobody wins, the, the evil fairy wins, and nobody on the board does of the players do. But, however, if one person does trigger that endgame, then players are all going to go ahead and count up all the magic that they have, either from their feats of magic card or some various other abilities and cards that will come out during the game. Whoever has the most magic wins, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. So, um, I... I haven't read the book, but I watched the BBC miniseries, and I really liked it. As you know, I'm a big fan of the Napoleonic era, Napoleonic Wars. Um, I did a, a component of my PhD program is in the Napoleonic Wars. It's just a fascinating time period. I've read a lot about it, and it was kind of fun to see this, this alternate history magic fantasy element injected into it. Really had a lot of fun with the, with the BBC series. Maybe at some point down the road I'll read the book. But really enjoyed it. And so I was super excited when I saw this had come out. And I'd heard some reviews that were just so-so on it, but I still really wanted to try it. I still think it looked like it, there's, there was potential here. Um, so there's some, some, some interesting mechanics and dynamics that are, that are going on here. Um, I do like some, like I said, that tension between getting your prestige, because again, that gets you those connections, which makes you more powerful, um, versus actually doing the magic and gaining the points. There's an interesting dynamic there. I don't know that it that it works as well as maybe it should. It seems to me it's a little... Um, I, I don't know what the right word I'm looking for is, but it, it just didn't work. It didn't fit as much as I wanted it to, but but still, the general idea, I think, is, is pretty cool. I liked the, um, the way you did your actions, where you would choose an action, and then, of course, that was unavailable to you, and then you had to clear the, 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 your, your pool again before you could take any more actions, or that same action again, rather. And I like, I like that. I think that made some tough decisions, and, and, and it worked quite well. Um, but the, the, game, the game could be quite frustrating at times, because it seemed like there, there were times when you're set up to just to do something, or you know, to, to get a feat of magic or whatever, and then, oh, the Marseille card doesn't work, and I had to activate something else, so I couldn't activate that specific magic, so I can't do it. Okay, well, maybe next time. And there was just a lot of that in the game, and that was kind of frustrating. Um... But I do like I, I did like how the invitation systems would lead to the introductions, and then you could play the introductions how you wanted to play them. Um, I thought that was interesting. The fairy track was pretty interesting too. Uh, the man with the thistle down hair, how how that triggered the end game, but that wasn't necessarily the winner. But you're still invested in that. I thought that was that was interesting. But um, and, and I'll tell you right now, I'm a sucker for a map of Europe. But I got to tell you, I just I I kind of. Knowing the, the source material, I kind of found myself wanting more from this game. Now, I've seen some reviews that were very negative 
uh, toward this. Um, I usually don't watch a lot of reviews before I review a game, but but I didn't know I was going to be reviewing this one, and I'd seen reviews, and I, they were kind of negative, and, and I understand that, and I get that. And I didn't hate this game. I didn't hate it. But I didn't love it either. Um, I think it's interesting... I think, if, particularly if you're familiar with the source material, there's kind of some clever nods. Where, oh, okay, yeah, okay, okay. There was some of that going on. I don't know that that would have made a break, made the game for me, or broken it if they weren't there or anything. But, but it was fun. Um, what I'm saying is, I think this feels kind of like a like a rough draft of a game. I, it feels like it. They've got a lot of elements here, but somehow they're not quite clicking, and they may have made it... I mean, there's a lot more going on here than I, than I mentioned in my overview. There's a lot of different cards that are coming out, a lot of different things, and it seems like maybe if the game were a hair more streamlined, and they really emphasized some of the mechanics instead of just trying to maybe make it a little too IPE, I, I don't know. It just seemed like there was, there was a bit of a lost opportunity here. I could have really liked this game. I think if it was a little more streamlined, and, and they really emphasized some more of these factors here. Still, I didn't, I didn't hate the game, uh, my friends and I, we all kind of felt the same way. You know, it was it was a it was a fine game. It was a fun. We're glad we played it. Um, I don't know how often I'm going to be reaching for it. So I guess the recommendation here for the discriminating gamers: try it before you buy it. Um, you know, I think I think there's some people out there this may really appeal to. Generally, I just I I, I thought it was okay. Thank you once again for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. And speaking of astronauts, ladies and gentlemen, I was uh, reminded of that astronaut who went out into space, was on his spacewalk, took that look at Earth, and he was so overwhelmed, he had to see it with his own eyes, so he took off his space helmet, and i got to tell you, the view was breathtaking. Please somebody help me again and I don't know where I'm going and I don't know where I've been please somebody help me on the solid ground it's a long time and I'll be dying once a year I wind up in the band my nephew told me that one and I I, I thought that was stupid at first but then I got it